Good afternoon, everyone. This is Barbara Ann Hegan with the Greenwood Chamber of Commerce. We are very excited to partner with Self Regional Healthcare and welcome Dr. Matthew Logan, who will be providing an overview of where we're at with the impact of COVID-19 here in Greenwood and what Self Regional has been working on with the vaccination. We are excited to be able to have uh, all of you with us this afternoon. Thank you for taking uh, interest in this very important topic. We are recording this and we'll also share this on our YouTube video. And all of you should see in front of you a shared screen for the presentation. So without further ado, we welcome Dr. Logan. Thank you. Thank you all for having me today. And um, I just, just confirming you guys can see my screen okay? Yes, we can. Okay, great. All right, so um, what I'm going to do today is just kind of walk you all through a little bit of um, a little bit of history with uh, COVID-19 at our hospital, taking you back to the kind of the very beginning, and then we'll kind of work through up to where we are today and some of the things we've done at the hospital uh, to try to keep the community as safe as we can during this kind of an unknown time. Um, this first slide here that I'm going to share with you all uh, kind of takes us back to uh, some uh, predictive models that uh, really kind of came out of Europe when COVID first started uh, coming on the scene. If you guys recall, there was uh, a lot of unknowns early on in the COVID uh, pandemics, particularly if you all recall um, uh, news out of China that new hospitals were being built over the course of a week or two uh, to try to accommodate all of these patients. And then we saw uh, waves of COVID infection kind of sweeping across Europe. And you all probably remember the uh, uh, some of the dire news uh, that was coming out of Italy and uh, the hospitals there that were overrun and interviewing the physicians there. They just didn't have enough resources to care for the large surge of patients that were coming in. Um, we started feeling that pressure here in the United States, certainly at Self Regional Healthcare as well. And it's like, oh my goodness, what can we expect? Some of the early predictive models look like this graph I'm showing you here. This red line at that at the bottom shows the uh, the ICU uh, cr current critical care beds uh, ICU capacity for the for the United States. Um, and then uh, on the uh, on the y-axis kind of shows you like what could happen based on different mitigation factors. And we were looking at like a best case scenario for Greenwood that we might have to try to figure out how can we accommodate 250 to 300 critical care ICU patients requiring ventilators all at the same time. That was, a, uh, as you can imagine, <laughs> kind of a stressful time trying to sort through uh, through those thought processes. Um, you know, normally uh, we would have 30 ICU beds um, available at self regional at any one time and could ventilate up to 30 patients at a time. So, uh, you know, us and every other hospital in the country all at the same time uh, thinking like, how are we going to get enough ventilators? How are we going to provide oxygen therapy to all these patients? How are we going to uh, provide protective uh, equipment and masks uh, to our staff to help protect our staff from, from catching this unknown disease and getting sick. Um, that was really like the first month, month and a half of, of the pandemic and uh, preparation uh, in, in case of worst case scenario happened, um, how were we going to deal with that? And a big thank you out to the community and certainly some of those on this call today uh, donating masks and things like that early on in the pandemic. That was uh, uh, certainly uh, very much appreciated um, for the community. Again, a lot of unknowns early on. We did things like form uh, an ethics committee, um, and those are those are hard conversations to have. Um, whether ethics committee consisting of pastoral care services as well as our some of our medical teams, I was on that committee as well, talking through things like how do we determine who gets a ventilator if two or three people need a ventilator and we only have one. I mean, those are the kind of conversations that that we were having early on. Thank God it did not get to to that point, and we have been able to keep up with it. But again, those that was the early first month and a half uh, of this uh, was kind of getting prepared uh, for a worst case scenario. Um, I think most on the call are aware that we did pause elective surgeries early on uh, for about a month. Again, that was uh, in an attempt to uh, conserve PPE or the personal protective equipment, the masks and the gowns and those things um, as well. Um, 
And so, uh, so that was kind of early on. And then uh, what actually happened, this next slide shows uh, basically uh, the state COVID count or new, new cases per day um, since the beginning of really when it started back in March, uh, up through, I mean, yeah, March last year, up through March of this year and, uh, and kind of where we've been. That red line uh, is up there above this level. So we were able to keep up with, uh, with our ICU needs. Um, and one thing I'm really happy about here is to see that seven day moving average, that green line uh, trending down real nicely over the last several weeks. So of course we had that initial little surge about the summer and then um, a really significant surge um, in and around uh, after the holidays uh, when folks of course started gathering together more. Um, we kind of started seeing that here at the hospital as well. This next slide shows uh, specific to self-regional health care. What did we see by month? The number of uh, COVID uh, ad patients admitted to the hospital by month, starting on the left of March of uh, 2020 up until today. Um, in the last few months, I put a little trending data. Uh, November, December, and January, you can see like we had 7.6 admissions per day in January, and that came back down nicely in February. And uh, March is continuing the downward trend. Um, on the right slide is basically the number of deaths that we had for any one particular month um, or by the by average by a week. So November, December trended up a lot um, in January was our worst month for a number of deaths um, during the whole pandemic. And then uh, February has come down and March also continues the downward trend. Um, one question that I think also always comes up and all, also is very important is how are we doing at self regional healthcare and caring for this uh, potentially or this very sick population as compared to others? And um, if you look at our total admissions and our total deaths, our mortality rate is 15%, and as compared to a state average of 18.7%. So I do think our medical teams here have done a phenomenal job. Uh, providing excellent care, as good a care as you can get in South Carolina to this very sick population. Um, and again, just in summary, uh, to date, we've had a total of 179 COVID-related deaths and um, almost 1,200 COVID admissions uh, with a 15% death rate we talked about. Um, some of the things we did to care for this population, we dedicated an entire floor of the hospital to COVID-positive patients. Um, our sixth floor here at the hospital was dedicated for that purpose. We actually, uh, that, that floor filled up pretty quickly. Well, that'll hold, you know, around 30 patients. And so we had to expand that. At our most patients we had at any one time with COVID was 85 COVID positive patients. And that occurred in the middle of January. Um, to accommodate that, not that number of patients, we combined some other floors together. Our third and fourth floor of the main tower are used for uh, surgery, post-operative surgery patients. And we combine those two floors and uh, put all of the surgery patients on for floor four at that time and used floor three as a COVID overflow, overflow floor. Um, in addition, our ICUs at one point did fill completely up and we added 14 additional overflow ICU beds uh, on the second floor of the hospital, which is where our pediatrics unit was. We moved peds and then took some of those rooms and, uh, and outfitted them with monitors and, uh, and added additional 14 ICU overflow beds, uh, again, to accommodate the intensive care patients. Again, thank goodness those numbers have come down. Uh, as of today, we have seven COVID positive patients currently admitted to the hospital um, and, uh, and three, only three in the ICU, uh, down from up in that 30 range um, uh, at one point, uh, and only two on the ventilator, which is great. Like I mentioned, our medical teams are providing really great care to this population. Um, myself and others on our medical services uh, participate in weekly calls with the South Carolina Hospital Association, just keeping up with the latest treatments available for COVID, um, as well as uh, we've partnered with MUSC and their intensive care team down there as well, uh, developing our protocols for treatment and whatnot as well, just to ensure that we're kind of, again, we're not a research institute at Self Regional and our physicians are phenomenal here, uh, but just to make sure we're up on the latest and greatest of uh, what the possible treatments are out there. Um, again, just to provide the best, the best care that's possible. Um, another uh, thing that did become available in November that, that I'll speak to just briefly um, is uh, outpatient COVID-19 uh, monoclonal antibody therapy. Um, this uh, became available in November. Um, and uh, this, if you recall, uh, when uh, President Trump 
contracted COVID. He got admitted up to the hospital and was given a monoclonal antibody therapy. He was actually given the Regeneron product. There are two products, Regeneron and then Bamlanivimab uh, is the other one. That we, we have Bamlanivimab here, but they basically do the same thing. It's an it's a infusion of antibodies that attack COVID in, infection. You have to get or give it early in the course of illness prior to getting so sick, you have to be admitted to the hospital. And uh, what the studies found was that the rate of admission and the rate of death was significantly reduced by use of bamlanivimab therapy. There was a study in the New England Journal of Medicine that came out in November of, uh, of uh, 2020 uh, that really, uh, really showed this pretty, pretty explicitly, uh, the significant improvement in outcomes when uh, given monoclonal antibody therapy early in treatment. So we hopped on it. Uh, one of the things I love about our organization is how nimble we are. Um, we were able to convert an old pre-testing area into a, an infusion area with uh, five to six rooms. Uh, we were able to flex it a little bit, and uh, we were able to infuse up to 20 patients per day uh, with bamlanivimab. Um, we have given since the start back in November a total of 759 infusions. Out of that population, we've had 36 admissions. Um, we would have expected that out of that, again, this high-risk patient population that had 23 deaths, and we've actually had three deaths. Um, we can use these numbers to estimate that bamlanivimab therapy here at Self Regional, we've been able to prevent about 78 admissions and prevent about 20 deaths through the use of this product. So we're really excited to be able to offer that here. If you look at this, these graphs here, you'll see that Greenwood is truly a leader in the state uh, of South Carolina. And I'm really proud of Self Regional for jumping all over this. Um, if you look at Greenwood and compare us to Greenville, the number of infusions we've given versus some of the other uh, large, much larger hospital systems around the state. Uh, I, I really think we've made a big difference for our community through the use of this. But just wanted to share that with the group. So we'll move on to the more fun stuff. Um, so uh, Benjamin Franklin said, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. That's, that is the truth. It's the truth that certainly in COVID, as well as in a lot of other areas, but um, so early on, this is basically, and up until just very recently, all we really had was wear a face mask when in public and around others outside of your home, wash your hands often and social distance and avoid large gatherings, particularly indoors. Um, this still uh, is the recommendation. However, now that we are starting to get around the corner a little bit and have some vaccines available, um, I hope that we can get to some, back to some sense of normalcy um, you know, in the coming months. Um, so we have two ways at Self Regional Healthcare that you can register to get a vaccine if you're in a qualifying group. Um, one is our website, and uh, that's www.selfregional.org. If you just go to that website at the top of the page, there's a link that can be clicked on, and, and if you follow that, it'll take you to our vaccine or our COVID information area where uh, the COVID vaccine request form can be clicked on. Uh, and, and folks can register directly on there. The other option is for a phone, a phone call, uh, which is these lines are open Monday through Friday from nine to five. The number's there on your screen, 725-3555. Um, so now we've talked about that briefly, I'll kind of tell you about uh, the number of uh, vaccines that we've given at Self Regional so far. Um, so this slide says we've administered over 30,000 COVID-19 vaccines. I'll give the exact numbers. I just got an update just before this call, and we have given a total of 33,811 vaccines as of this morning. And uh, first dose vaccines are 18,694. That's as of this morning and our, our latest numbers. Uh, we expect to add somewhere around 750 uh, to that number. Uh, today, which is great. Uh, that's about what we're administering every day right now. Um, I want to briefly talk about how does the COVID-19 vaccine work? I think this is a common question that people have and a lot of misconceptions. And if I could just break it down for you, like to make it super simple, I think this picture and the next picture will really show you kind of what the vaccines do and how they work. This picture is basically just a, a diagram of, of what the the SARS-CoV-2 virus or the, the virus that causes COVID-19 disease looks like. This is it. Um, on the inside, you'll see that, see that pink core, which is made out of viral RNA, then is surrounded with a, um, a membrane that has some proteins and things in there. And then the big orange kind of yellowish looking proteins on the outside are the spike proteins. These spike proteins are what allow the virus to bind to the human cell 
uh, to some specific receptors that are found on the human cell. And when that happens, the virus then merges with the cell and injects this RNA inside the cell and infects the cell uh, with the viral RNA. That viral RNA then uh, gets into the, the cytoplasm or the inside of the cell and takes over the ribosomes, which help read RNA sequences, basically. And they, your, your own ribosomes read this viral RNA and just churn out millions of viruses. So that's kind of the life cycle of how that works. And those kind of bust the cell open and release their, uh, the, these millions of viruses out into your bloodstream. You get sick. They get in your respiratory system. You start coughing them out, spreading the virus around to others. But that spike protein there is the key to how the virus gets inside the cell. And that's the target that all of the vaccines that are, are made right now are creating antibodies to bind to that spike protein. This next slide uh, really shows you exactly how the RNA vaccines are made. That spike protein on this diagram represented in, in the green is that one small sequence of RNA out of that whole entire sequence of viral RNA. Um, and through some amazing technology, um, the scientists, we are able to, the creators of the vaccines, have been able to splice out only the part of RNA that codes for the spike protein only. So the vaccine only contains that sequence of RNA that codes for that spike protein. The rest of that virus that you see over there on your bottom left side of your screen is not coded for at all. Um, and so any thought that the vaccine may cause COVID disease, I think can be dispelled if you kind of have a little basic understanding of how the vaccine works. So the, what happens in the vaccine, they take this sequence in this diagram in green and they, they mix that, that RNA sequence that only codes for the spike protein with a lipid, which is just a fat emulsion that allows the, this RNA sequence to get inside of your cell. And what happens when you get injected with the vaccine, this, uh, this, viral, this RNA sequence, um, it gets in the cell, very similar to how the virus gets in, um, and then it recruits your ribosomes to code for the spike protein. The spike protein is then released out into your bloodstream, and then your body recognizes that as a foreign substance that should not be there. And it creates antibodies against that spike protein, and that's what provides the protection from the vaccine. And you can get that protection from the vaccine without having to get the infection. Um, the other way you can get antibodies against a spike protein is to actually get the infection. Um, and that's what you want to try to avoid. So, again, this is an amazing technology for uh, for vaccine development that uh, was uh is we're really fortunate to live in a time where, where something, the technology is here and available to where you can splice a sequence of RNA out and only code for that specific protein that you want to. Um, it's not a live vaccine in any way. As you can see, it's only coding for this one little piece of the virus, the, the protein. Um, and so it's, uh, it's much safer than some of the other vaccines that are on the market today. This next slide I'm showing you is direct slide from the study um, that was uh, submitted to the FDA by Pfizer. Um, if, again, this is a graph of the Pfizer vaccine results, uh, study results. If I were to put up here a graph of the Moderna vaccine study results, it would look almost exactly the same. What we have on the y-axis is cumulative incidence of COVID infection, and on the x-axis is days after first dose of vaccine. In the study, the way the study was designed, um, they injected a total of right around 44,000 uh, individuals with uh, half getting placebo, half getting the true vaccine. And for those that got placebo, they followed the incidence along this blue path on the upper line, uh, showing that the incidence, cumulative incidence of COVID infection uh, had a steady increase over time since first injection. Um, and then the red line is the treatment group that actually got the vaccine. And you can see the significant change in incidence of COVID infection uh, amongst the treatment group versus the placebo group. This shows more than anything I can tell you just visually in one kind of graph, like how well the vaccine works. You can see in the inset in the top left corner that there was a divergence somewhere around day 12 after the first vaccine where that really that first vaccine started kicking in. Um, what we know from the Pfizer and Moderna trials is that um, 
at two weeks after the second dose, they're about between, well, Moderna says 94 and Pfizer 95 percent effective at preventing symptomatic COVID infection. Um, and so, uh, again, it's very impressive when you consider like the annual flu vaccine has a uh, uh, prevention rate somewhere between 55 and 60 percent when you get a flu shot. It's not 100 percent, but it's pretty, pretty darn good. Um, we'll go to the next slide. So who is eligible for vaccine? Um, right now, as you all know, um, phase 1B just opened up uh, this Monday, uh, and that is for anyone who is 55 and older uh, now qualifies to, uh, to get vaccinated. And also those who are, of course, younger than 65, excuse me, younger than 55 who have certain comorbid conditions. And I'll be honest with you, these these conditions um, are are really kind of a little loose. They say things like chronic lung disease. Well, what does that mean? That that does mean things like asthma. It means COPD. It means any kind of interstitial lung disease. Uh, anyone with diabetes. Anyone who's overweight. Anyone with heart disease. Anyone with really a, a whole host of medical problems would now qualify. There is a large group of people. Um, who uh, who do qualify under these new guidelines? In addition to to just individuals in general, uh, frontline workers with increased occupational risk. So that's basically um, uh, folks who work around other people, uh, which is just about anyone who has a job in a, in a setting where you're around other people, which is most most folks. Some people work alone, I guess, in an office setting, but um, the majority of folks who have jobs actually do qualify at this point. Um, and then uh, where you, again, work around people or around other people a lot, um, I do see migrant farm workers uh, as well are on this list. Um, and of course, everyone who's already in phase 1A, uh, which is uh, is basically anyone who's 65 and older and all healthcare workers. So basically at this point, it's opened up to a lot of people. Uh, the next phase per DHEC, uh, they estimate around April 12th that they will go ahead and open it to everyone who's healthy and 45 and above um, and any other essential workers that kind of haven't had an opportunity to get it yet. And then uh, May 3rd, uh, again, DHEC is estimating May 3rd, they will open it up to basically anyone that wants it. The reason that they uh, they went with age 16 and above is uh, specifically because the uh, the study, uh, the Pfizer vaccine study anyway, was uh, was only done in those who are 16 years and older. Um, and so the FDA hasn't approved it for anyone less than 16 years old. Uh, the Moderna vaccine and the Johnson Johnson vaccine did not have study participants less than 18 years old. And so the, those have only been approved for 18 and older, just for your information. Um, I'll go through a few common uh, common questions that I've received over the last uh, you know month or two uh, since I've we've kind of been uh, opening up the vaccine some and then um, we can talk a little bit more about it. But these are some common questions that I get. Um, so what side effects should I expect after being vaccinated? Um, the most common side effect would be like a, a sore arm or sore shoulder um, that typically lasts uh, about two days. Um, and then just you typically goes away. It's easily treated with Tylenol or Motrin. Other people do develop some uh, some body aches, some uh, low grade fever happens on occasion um, and uh, and joint aches. I had a, a little bit of joint aches to my fingers on my my second day after I received my second dose of vaccine. But that's really about it uh, for most people. There will be an occasional person that may run a little higher, higher fever for a couple of days. Um, but the instance of that's pretty low, uh, but it does occasionally happen. Um, but most people do great with it and don't really have any major side effects. Other question is, can the COVID-19 vaccine infect me with COVID? I kind of addressed that a few minutes ago, but no, it can't. It's impossible for it to give you COVID infection. That RNA sequence only codes for the spike protein on the outside of the uh, virus. It's not code for the whole virus itself. <clears throat> can the COVID-19 vaccine make me test positive for COVID? The COVID-19 vaccine cannot make you test positive for COVID via a nasal swab. So if you have a nasal swab that is positive, then you have COVID-19, even though you've been vaccinated. Again, it's, it's an unusual event, particularly after, two weeks after the second dose, but it does occasionally happen. Um, and uh, the advantage of the vaccine, even if it may not prevent 100%, of the of COVID infections, those that do get infected typically have a much more very mild case of uh, of 
of infection than if you had not been vaccinated. So that's uh, another definite positive for, for getting the vaccine. But again, 95% of the time it prevents symptomatic COVID infection. Other question, um, I have already had COVID. Can I still get the vaccine and should I get the vaccine? And uh, that the answer to that is uh, yes, you should still get the vaccine. The, uh, the studies uh, of Moderna, Pfizer, and Johnson Johnson have shown that those that receive the vaccine actually have a much more robust immune response than if you don't, uh, than if you have actually natural COVID infection. So, uh, and also the antibody response seems to last longer after the vaccine than if you have COVID infection. So definitely it would be a good idea to go ahead and get vaccinated, even if you have contracted uh, or have previously had COVID infection. And then when can you get it uh, after infection? When, once you finish your quarantine period, uh, typically 10 days after symptom onset and having no symptoms for 24 hours, you're then eligible to, uh, to, to, go, to get the vaccine. Um, one thing I will mention is that um, even though you're eligible, we do know that after a COVID infection that almost everyone, it's like there's been like just a couple of cases in the country that folks have become reinfected with COVID within three months after having COVID. So if you wanted to put off for a little while till at least uh, three months after contracting natural COVID infection before becoming vaccinated, that would be fine. Um, because the risk of being reinfected within that first three months would be low. We do know that the, uh, the antibodies from COVID infection do start to wane between three and six months, and, uh, and the risk of being reinfected would, would start going back up. So um, I would recommend um, if you want to go ahead and get it, that's fine. But if you want to wait three months, that's also okay. Um, other question, can the COVID-19 vaccine alter my DNA? Um, if Again, just knowing a little bit about the biology of this now, after looking at those slides we looked at a few minutes ago, um, the virus itself contains a much longer and much more genes uh, that's entering your cell than the vaccine does. The vaccine only calls for that S piece. That whole COVID RNA codes for all those other genes that go in there as well to code for the rest of the virus. Um, and so, uh, so essentially if i have my choice of getting like that one little tiny piece of the s rna or versus getting all of that inside of my cells i would take that little tiny s protein piece um but the again another thing about rna vaccines which is is really pretty cool the the dna of our cells is stored inside of the nucleus of the cell the nucleus has its own membrane around it and RNA is coded in every one of our cells inside that nucleus from the DNA. So the, the normal sequence is DNA codes for RNA. RNA exits the nucleus out into the cytoplasm of the cell outside of the nucleus and gets coded for and gets read. That code gets read. It's a one-way street. When there's RNA out in the cytoplasm, it cannot get back inside the nucleus. And so the RNA does not come in contact with your DNA uh, from the vaccine. And therefore, it is impossible for COVID-19 vaccine of an RNA vaccine to alter the DNA in any way. So this is a resounding no. The COVID-19 vaccine cannot alter the DNA. Um, how much does the vaccine cost? Um, well, the government has purchased these directly from the companies that make them, Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson, and uh, they ship those to the hospitals and other pharmacies around the country, um, and there is no cost for the vaccine itself. Um, there is an administrative uh, admi administering cost that we, you know, we do have a, a lot of staff that, that we have nurses and uh, support staff that, that help with our vaccine clinic. Um, and we do charge bill the insurance for the administration of the vaccine. But if anyone does not have any insurance, that's okay. There is no copay charge to the patient in any circumstance. So if you have like phenomenal insurance that, that pays everything, we'll bill the insurance, but there's no copay for anyone. Um, and if you don't have any insurance, we still give you the vaccine and there's no charge for it. So no charge to a patient. Uh, directly out of pocket, but we will bill insurance uh, to help cover some of the administration costs of running the clinic. Can the COVID-19 vaccine make me infertile? Another question that has come up a lot and a lot of mis misinformation on social media around this. Um, 
but um, it, there's there's no reason to think that the COVID-19 vaccine will make anyone infertile. Um, they have done uh, specific animal studies on this, and they've not found any fertility in any any of the animal studies. In addition to that, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, as well as the Maternal Fetal Medicine Society, issued a statement recently, basically refuting this, saying that it just logically of how the vaccine works. It makes no sense that the COVID-19 vaccine could make anyone infertile. And you can Google that just if you Google American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology and COVID-19 vaccine fertility questions or things like that. There's a lot of information out there. I would go to trusted sources like that rather than perhaps Facebook shares and things where you can find a lot more information if you want to read more detail. But bottom line, there's no evidence that a COVID-19 vaccine will have any any impact whatsoever on fertility uh, for anyone going forward. Another question is, um, I received monoclonal antibody treatment for COVID. Do I need to wait to get the vaccine? Again, I mentioned that on the previous slide about our monoclonal antibody treatment. And uh, th there is a delay that is recommended in that situation. The recommendation is to wait three months after receiving monoclonal antibody treatment before you receive the vaccine. The reason is not that it would cause you any harm per se, but those antibodies, again, bind to the S protein and that protein that you're creating by the vaccine is that S protein. And so the thought is that those monoclonal antibodies that you received in infusion could make it where you don't make as good of an antibody response to the vaccine, uh, a, long, a longer term antibody response. So they wait, rec the recommendation is to wait three months um, and then proceed with the, uh, the vaccination uh, in, in monoclonal antibody treatment cases. Other question is, uh, how long does the vaccine provide me with protection? This is a very good question. Um, I was fortunate to be able to participate in a call um, through the South Carolina Hospital Association with Tim Mullinex. Tim is the medical director for vaccine development with Pfizer. And this question was asked to him um, on a recent call. And his answer to this question was that, while we don't know 100% sure, we anticipate that it will be last. The protection will last at least a year, possibly two years. And uh, what they are going to do is, in their study population, again, 22,000 who received the actual vaccine in the study population, they're following them uh, for for two years, and they'll be checking antibody titers on them periodically along the way. And recommendations on. Um, um, any type of booster shots will be made going forward. But currently the, the estimate is that it will last at least a year um, and possibly two years uh, before a booster might be needed. So uh, more information to come on that, but that's, that's the best I can give you at this time on that. And then uh, another question, a lot, we've seen a lot of this on the news about variants um, and will the vaccine work on variants? Well, let's talk about that for a second. So what is a variant? What a variant is, is where uh, when the virus replicates, and again, millions, uh, in one individual, there will be millions of copies of this virus that are copying each other. Sometimes there can be errors in the translation of that RNA, and there can be some changes in the base pairs, which will cause a, a slight structural change in, that, in the proteins of the virus, specifically, again, that S protein that we've been talking about. And if there's a mild, a mild structural change in the S protein, um, it, it, it could some, sometimes in the variants, it can give them an advantage of what allows them to bond to the human cells better. Um, could, a, could a structural change in the S protein make it where the antibodies that you have from the vaccine don't bond to the S protein as well? That's the potential um, of, of what could happen. Now, fortunately, um, some, some recent data has been shown, it's been looked at pretty closely, of the Pfizer vaccine, Moderna vaccine, both seem to work pretty well on the variants, maybe some slight efficacy drop as compared uh, to the original strand of COVID, but they both seem to work really well um, on the, any variants that are known right now. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine also works pretty well on the majority of variants, but the, uh, the South African variant maybe not quite as good uh, as on some of the others, but so uh, still some more to come on that. But right now we do think that the vaccines do a pretty good job at uh, protecting, uh, protecting against the known variants as well. Um, so I'll go to my next slide real quick and then we'll open it up for some questions. Um, so getting back to normal and is the worst behind us? Um, 
So like I mentioned early on, it, today in the hospital, we have seven patients who are COVID positive in the hospital. Um, back on October the 1st, from reviewing some of our internal data, we had seven COVID positive patients in the hospital. And we all know kind of what happened from looking at our previous slides, what happened over the holiday season um, and uh, the big spike that we had kind of after Christmas and January. But this is different this time, I truly believe, because we now have had the opportunity to vaccinate so many people. As I mentioned before, we've administered over 33,000 vaccines at this point. And so those people will have a level of protection that certainly was not there before. <clears throat> also, a large portion of the population has had COVID. Um, again, they may have had an, a low symptom case, may not have been tested. Um, what we do know is that the, the estimates are somewhere between five and 10 times as many people actually had at least a mild case of COVID and didn't know it as compared to those that actually tested positive. If that's the case, hopefully we'll be getting herd immunity quicker than we originally thought. Um, but we still uh, we still got to get the vaccines uh, and more people uh, to really get to that herd immunity. But I do think the worst is behind us. Uh, we'll know as a little more time passes, but uh, I'm very hopeful that that we're on the other side of the worst of this. Um, you, all, you all may have seen that there was some recent update in the CDC guidance for people who have received the vaccine. Um, and uh, the CDC um, recently this week released some uh, some new guidance, of which basically states that if a group of vaccinated people are together, a small group of vaccinated people, like at a small meeting or uh, a small gathering, say a, a church Bible study, for example, if everyone in that meeting has been vaccinated, they can visit freely without worrying about social distancing or having to wear a mask. Um, that is good news. That's the first time we've really had uh, an opportunity to to try to let the guard down a little bit, at least per CDC guidelines. I know people have maybe done without following CDC guidance, but at least uh, to to give that level of uh, comfort doing that um, and spending time with with folks uh, like parents and folks like that. I know for me. Um, uh, my parents this past weekend, I was certainly I was glad to have them over and able to have a meal with them, uh, with my family and not have to quite worry about them. It, it, could I you know, harm my mom or dad, um, it, you know, and, and, and they end up in the hospital sick with COVID because of letting our guard down that situation. So knowing this new guidance is out is, is very comforting. And I, and I certainly hope as the incidence of COVID infection continues to drop across our state and the country that the CDC will even further loosen some of the recommendations, but that's where we are as of right now. So big question is when can we get back to normal and kind of not have to worry about stuff as much? I know the governor here in South Carolina, as well as other states have already said, we'll go ahead and open everything back up. Um, I get that, but we still need to take some precautions uh, for the time being with uh, still recommend social distancing and uh, until more people are vaccinated, it is definitely recommended to continue to to wear masks uh, in public when around folks that aren't are part of your core family, uh, those type things. So uh, when will that go away? Again, I think once the incidence overall of COVID goes down um, and uh, and I anticipate by the fall, I hope if we can continue on the trend we're on right now with the numbers falling and uh, increase in vaccinations, um, I, I would love nothing more than to have uh, going into the fall season when school and whatnot is getting ready to start back for the kids again, to have a much more uh, normal type uh, type life again. So that's kind of my presentation I wanted to share with you all. And I am glad to entertain any questions anyone has about the vaccine or any other questions about what's been going on in the hospital or really anything at all. Thank you, Dr. Logan, for your excellent presentation. Uh, we do welcome questions. You can use uh, either the chat or unmute yourself. Uh, one of the things that I will be providing is uh, this presentation, as I mentioned, will be up on our YouTube. We'll embed it in a link to everyone. And I do have a uh, flyer from Self Regional Healthcare that we'll be able to send as an attachment with some of the uh, Q&A that was provided today.
Was that a question that we had from somebody or was that, uh, no? Okay, well, bearing no other questions, uh, again, thank you very, very much, Dr. Logan, and to the South Regional Healthcare for all the great work that you have provided to us during this entire pandemic. We are uh, excited to help share this information, keep our members educated, and wish uh, wellness and health for everyone. Hey, Barbara Ann, this, this is Brandon Smith. You mind if I ask Dr. Logan oh, a question? Please do. Um, hey, Matt. Hey. Uh, Matt and I talk regularly, but while while we, I got him on the line, I might as well ask, uh, how is supply of the vaccines all three compared to demand right now. Um, I, you know, and I, I guess I ask because I, I understand, of course, that production is on all three is is ramping up dramatically, and as I understood it, demand was was exceeding supply, and I I just hope we can get to a neutral position or where supply exceeds demand. Yeah, thanks for that question, Brandon. That's a good question. Um, so right now, uh, with the new phase open up, we have a huge demand again. Um, this morning, for example, uh, we again, the web form that gets is option to fill out online, we had over 4,000 requests on the web form that we're working right now to schedule for vaccine. And uh, what we are receiving from the state right now is uh, a little over 2,000 this past week, uh, for first dose vaccines and about that same number of second dose vaccines um, for uh, uh, that was a kind of our allotment for uh, for the week. Um, so around 4,000 is what we got this past week. And honestly, we don't know from week to week 100% what we're going to get. We've asked for around 5,000 first doses per week, and we seem to be getting consistently around 2,000 per week. Um, but we, uh, we, we are geared up and at the hospital here, we can pretty easily vaccinate a thousand people a day or give a thousand shots a day through our vaccine clinic, uh, which is 5,000 a week. Um, we run it Monday through Friday. If we could do 5,000 a week for a couple months, we would really knock out a lot of folks who would like to be vaccinated. Um, but as of right now, the demand is still exceeding the supply that we receive. We would welcome more supply of vaccine. Currently, we're uh, being allocated the Pfizer vaccine um, through the hospital. Uh, we do have a small supply of Moderna that DHEC allocated us for some outreach clinics, specifically in Saluda County. Um, actually, we're over there today uh, doing a vaccine clinic in Saluda. Uh, and, uh, and so we do have a small allotment of Moderna we're using for that specific purpose. We have not been allocated any of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine yet at the hospital. Um, we were told last week that the state was receiving around 41,000 doses of the Johnson Johnson vaccine uh, that is being uh, uh, kind of shipped to individual retail pharmacies, um, and and we don't have any of those at, through the hospital. And so there may be some some pharmacies in Greenwood that have it. I'm not aware if they are, but it's possible there could be some pharmacies in Greenwood that have Johnson Johnson vaccine. But here at the hospital, it's still we're still being allocated Pfizer vaccine. Dr. Logan, I have another question that came through our chat. Are the numbers 33K shared earlier, including the vaccines given locally by CVS and Walgreens? No, those are only our numbers. Those are self-regional healthcare administered vaccines. Okay. Thank you so much. Sure. Okay, hey, bearing there's no other questions, I believe that concludes our program for this afternoon. Again, a sincere thank you to all our participants and to Dr. Logan and Self Regional Healthcare. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. Thank Stay you. well.